Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the third day of NetDev. I hope everyone's having a great time and enjoying all the presentations and high quality content we've had so far. So today, I'm going to talk about one of my long-running favorite topics to talk about. Well, I guess this has become my favorite topic because uh, uh, getting results in this area is uh, really pleasurable in my personal opinion. So we're going to talk about uh, shrinking data structures and uh, let's get right to it. So in my opinion, small is beautiful. Uh, if you look at a lot of architectural uh, masterminds over the years, this is uh, something that they believe as well. Small and simple is something to strive for. And uh, I believe that's the same for software as well. Um, so look at some critical Linux networking data structures in the tree. <coughs> the first one we have is the packet metadata structure called SKBuff. It's about 216 bytes. And one thing to note about this is uh, it heavily contributes to the transactional cost of every packet traversing through the networking stack. This is indisputable. So any change to this structure, however minor or minuscule, has uh, enormous implications for performance and uh, functionality in the kernel. Uh, so that thing is 216 bytes. Uh, another thing that's uh, in particular to mention about this data structure is that we are extremely strict about any addition whatsoever to this. Uh, you're going to have to do something uh, really incredible to convince us to even add a bit to this structure. It, that's how critical it is to the Linux networking stack. Uh, the next one is the struct dest entry, and there's going to be quite a bit of content about this data structure in the keynote. Uh, this is the base class for every single route type that we have in the Linux kernel. So IPv4 routes, IPv6 routes, IPsec routes, they all start with a, a dest entry as their base class. And it's currently 160 bytes, and uh, as we'll see later, that's far too large. It's unnecessarily large. Um, so as I said, the IPv4 route, it's called struct R table, uh, is the struct dest entry plus some IPv4 specific information, and it's currently 216 bytes. The IPv6 route, RT6 info, likewise, uh, starts with a dest entry and then has a bunch of IPv6 info, and it's 384 bytes. Now, obviously, IPv4, si I, um, excuse me, IPv6 addresses are far larger than IPv4 addresses. Uh, therefore, even if it contained the same number of kinds of information, it would be larger, but it's, it's to an order of magnitude larger because it, it stores more addresses in its uh, protocol specific area than the IPv4 does. So maybe we can uh, fix that somehow. Because and theref therefore, another way to think about it is uh, every address we move from the RT6 info has a larger impact than removing an address from the IPv4 route. So we should strive to, to do something about that. Next, we have something called struct common. It's kind of like the base class for the all sockets. Uh, it's 136 bytes. Uh, then we have struct sock itself, which is Furthermore, a base class for all protocol-specific sockets in a networking tree, and that's 704 bytes, and that's quite large. Um, and then we have the struct net device, which is almost 2K, and this doesn't even take into consideration all the sysfs files that are uh, instantiated when you uh, create a, a net device and, and, open and set it up. So that thing's even enormous by an order of magnitude even more. So it looks like we have a lot of work to do, and things have uh, clearly clearly spun out of control. So why does this matter? Performance is the dictating factor for a lot of these decisions. As I mentioned, with the SK buff, uh, minor uh, modifications to these data structures have enormous performance implications for everyone. Smaller data structures, less cast misses. This is something almost all of us who work on the kernel understand at this point. Size is also about complexity. Bigger things are harder to understand. Um, and harder to maintain. This goes into what my, my area. You don't want to make things harder to maintain. That means more work for me. And memory is a scarce resource, even on large systems, because on large systems, you're trying to handle large number of connections, large number of routes, large number of packets in flight, et cetera, et cetera. So making things smaller is great for everyone. So what kind of techniques can we use to fix this uh, data structure bloat? problem? Well, the first one is a, a technique which I call uncommoning. And the next one is called state compression. That's about uh, taking the rep reducing the representation of a piece of data to the smallest point possible. Uh, unused pointer bit storage, which is interesting. It turns out that the lowest bits of pointers are freely usable for Boolean and other kinds of small integer state. 
Uh, unionizing state-specific members, so uh, I first came across this technique in the struct page in the kernel. They've been using this for a long time. You have two data structure members that are used at completely disjoint points in time in the data structure's lifetime, therefore it's, it's, it's safe to use the same area of the data structure to hold that value. Uh, we have using lookup keys instead of object pointers, so if the key that you use to look up an object that sits in the kernel is smaller than a pointer, then it may make sense to store the key instead of the object pointer itself, and we'll get into that later. So, what is this fancy thing I called uncommoning? Well, uncommoning deals with the situation where you have members of a common base class that are only used by some of the, the subclasses. So what tends to happen when we design data structures is we have four types of objects, an IPv4 route, an IPv6 route, an IPsec route, and we try to see what's common amongst them and just put it into the base class that they can all share. And that's what happened with struct dest entry. However, over time, some of the su subclasses stop using those common dest entry members, and we haven't uh, updated dest entry to reflect this fact in a reasonable way. In many cases, as we will find in this presentation, the common entry in the dest, dest structure only is used by one of the subclasses, so that's absolutely inappropriate. Uh, so what should we do? We should push it down into the subclasses that actually use them, and we'll talk about that now. So here is dest entry as it exists before we make any changes. As you can see, we have a struct net device. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to have a route without a, a device that the route points to, right? So it doesn't seem to be a clear way to get rid of that. We have an RCU head, so routes are generally freed by RCU freeing, so that's probably going to stay there. We have dest entry child, that's a candidate, and we'll get into why later. Uh, we have metrics. Uh, we have an, a set of operations uh, at this offset, and by the way, these are the hexadecimal offsets of all the uh, data structure members in struct des dest entry. That's what these numbers are over here. Uh, so we'll keep track of where everything is laying in the data structure. Uh, metrics, uh, all kinds of routes have metrics, such as the RTT and things of this nature, so that's probably going to stay there. We have an expiration. All routes ha have various kinds of expiration times for dealing with PMTU events and things of this nature, so that's probably something we'll have to keep in there. We have uh, pointers to other dest entries, uh, a routing path and a from. Well, we'll have to see what's going to go on with those two. We have a transform state, which is a pointer to IPsec specific information. And this, this member serves two purposes. It's a pointer to the IPsec specific information, it's also an indicator that the, this dest entry is serving as a base class for an IPsec route. So there are some clever things we might be able to do with that later. We have an input and output method that's rather fundamental. We have some random flags, an error indication, an obsolete state, a bunch of small integer values, a uh, header and trailer lens for uh, telling various layers how much space is needed to build, uh, build packets that are backed by these kind of routes. We have a traffic class ID for the packet scheduler, and then we have some padding, which uh, is an important issue which we'll discuss in this, in this presentation, and then we have the reference count. Now, you'll notice that the reference count sits at offset 64, and that's important, and we'll get into that later. Uh, we have a, a use count. Uh, every time the route gets referenced, we bump the use count. We have a timestamp, which says, when was the last time this route was used? That seems pretty fundamental, right? We have a pointer to a lightweight tunnel state, and then we have this union. And it's a pointer based upon the type of uh, route that this is serving as a base class of, the next pointer. So it's a, that this is where we get 160 bytes from. Uh, so, and we, you'll see that diagram several times throughout this presentation as we make modifications to dest entry. So dest entry next, this is how I came down this path. I looked and I said, well, the next pointer isn't even used by IPv4 routes. That's, I mean, it can be removed completely, so we should push it down to the subclasses that actually do use it. I mentioned dest entry child. It's only used by IPsec routes. Uh, when IPsec builds a bundle of transformations, the transformations add things like ESP headers, authentication headers, and so forth. And then underneath that, we have a chain down to the actual IPv4 route, which will route the IPsec packet. So the chain is only used by IPsec to hold the bundle together to, to keep it in one piece so you could traverse it from top to bottom. So we'll, give that, we'll push that down to IPsec. Um, this entry from, what's this used for? 
So IPv6 routes sit in the fib tree, and then when we want to create clones or copies of that route, we use the from pointer to remember what fib entry we got the route from so we can update the uh, expiration, the route expiration timestamp in the, in the thing it came from, not in the object itself. So that's important for IPv6. So let's push it down to there. Uh, path is another thing used by IPsec specifically. It points to the actual transport route that's going to push the IPsec encapsulated bits uh, to the next hop. So we can give that to IPsec. So there are several members of desk entry that are absolutely not used by more than one uh, route type, as we are finding now. Now, pushing all these elements down are well and good, but what is that actually going to do to the size of the struct desk entry? Well, unfortunately, it's not going to shrink it very much, and here's why. I showed you that padding, and why is that padding there? The reason is we tried to align this, the ref count on a 64-byte boundary. Why is that? Because uh, compared to a other elements of the dest entry, the, the reference count is very write heavy and means that the cache line that the ref count sits on will be dirty all the time. If you mix this with a whole bunch of read heavy objects, they create more cache thrashing between CPUs on the system. So we specifically align the reference count on a 64 byte cache line, then follow it by some other elements that are typically written and not read. So we, we use this alignment th member here called pad to align ref count to make sure that this, pre this condition is always met. Uh, so once we move all these things down into the subclasses, this, this array increases from 2 to 5, which is 40 bytes worth of completely wasted space in the data structure just for padding, and that's absolutely unacceptable, right? So after we uncommon everything, the desk entry is at 152 bytes, and the problem, as I stated, is this ugly red thing right here, which is the, the ref count padding, which is 40 bytes. So what can we do about this? And, and, and it, but if you look at the rest of the structure, it looks nice and more condensed and more concise and more really about what is common about all routes in a Linux kernel, and I think that's a really nice thing to see. So As I explained, this, is, this, 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 is, this padding is completely useless, and the reason it's there is to align the reference count. Um, but we have to make sure that we meet the, 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 the needs of the reference count alignment while, while not at the same time getting rid of the padding, and how can we do that? So we just rearrange things a little bit. And as you see here, we put the ref count at exactly 64 bytes offset. We move some things that were below the ref count and his friends up into here, uh, such as these lengths. And now what we have is a much smaller data structure at 112 bytes. So uh, I think that's pretty pretty for a couple of days of work, right? Isn't that nice? <laughs> OK, so um, what are we left with? So we killed 48 bytes from struct desk entry. Woo! We killed 48 bytes from struct R table. Woo! And IPv6 route gained 64 bytes of shrinkage. Woo! So wh why did IPv6 gain a larger amount of freed space than the other ones? Does anyone have any, any clue why this might be? OK, the reason is that one of the members of the IPv6 specific info in here is an IPv6 address with the cache line align directive given to it. So we bumped ourselves into yet another cache line, and therefore we were able to save a full 64 bytes for that reason. So that's behind that. Uh, the IPsec route stayed about the same and shrunk slightly, and it's at 448 bytes now. So that's th it gained a little bit as well. Although, um, if you look at the patch set that I posted on NetDev, uh, the, the majority of the changes were for IPsec because uh, a lot of the pushdowns happened to the IPsec route. So I was very concerned that I broke IPsec, but uh, the IPsec maintainer, Stefan Klassert, assured me that he ran his tests. And as far as he can see, everything still passes. So let's ship it, right? <laughs> um, now, if you look at this, I computed all these offsets by hand, uh, but real men compute structure offsets by hand. But for the rest of you, there is this tool called PA Hole. Uh, PA Hole is uh, one of many incredible tools written by Arnaldo Carvalho uh, de Mello. Uh, 
who uh, wanted to work on all kinds of tools to help developers analyze the kernel data structures and make improvements to them. Um, it's part of the Dwarves set of utilities, so on whatever distribution you're on, it, the package is called Dwarves or Dwarves something, so that you can just install this very easily on your machine. And PA Hole can shoot, compute structure layouts using debugging info contained in the object file. Uh, you can do all kinds of clever things with it, like say, please only show me data structures that have this uh, prefix string to them. Uh, use a, it, it also can tell you on what cache line each, each member of the data structure sits on and how much more you would have to do to move it to the next cache line. And it, the cache line is configurable. You can tell it how big of a cache line to use. So uh, regardless of what the CPU characteristics are that you're targeting, you can make p-hole show you information based upon that. Um, so how would you use it? Install the Dwarves package, get it on your system. Uh, then you build a kernel with config debug info. Now, here's the, here's the awesome part. You don't have to build the whole kernel just to look at a specific data structure if you're just trying to look at something really quickly. Uh, just build an object that references those data structures somehow. So I picked netcore desk.o here. And then you can use that in PA hole to display the layout of the data structure. So this. Uh, C64 that sets the cache line size and I'm choosing 64 because that's the cache line size that we're targeting in the networking in the debug on compile time check I showed you earlier for aligning the reference count. Uh, here's the data structure I want to see, dest entry. I want the offsets in hex because real men use hexadecimal. And uh, this object file that we built here and it will show you something that looks almost identical to the, my, my previous slide. So that's how you can use it and work on data structures in the kernel to shrink them and improve their, their layout. Um, let's talk a little bit about something called state compression. It's very common to have a lot of objects, uh, pieces of Boolean state in a data structure. But bool is too expensive. Uh, it, it uses more space than it actually needs to. Although it's very expressive, it's nice to see true false values all over the kernel and proper bool types. But for the most critical structures in the kernel, I think we can sac sacrifice a little bit of cleanliness for the sake of uh, uh, top performance, because that's what we're famous for. Um, sometimes even a 8-bit unsigned integer is too big. Uh, so the suggestion is to use either C bit fields, which is what we do in a lot of structures, such as skbuff and others, or group them into an, uh, an integer flags and make the flags only as big as you need to to fit all the bits. So if you only need 7 bits, use a U8. If you need 15 bits, use a U16, and so on and so forth. Uh, for non-Boolean values, you should actually try to understand the actual range of values that that uh, member actually holds and use the smallest type appropriate for that range of values. Uh, I guess it would be nice if we could have some compiler support or some kind of uh, uh, automated way to determine these kinds of things. But usually if you study most of the code, you can see that, oh, this only has a header length. And we know that pro in, in protocols, we only have headers up to this size. Therefore, the range is x. And you can use that value x to determine what an appropriate uh, type would be for the, uh, for the integer in question. So that's one way to do some state compression. Another interesting technique, which I really like a lot, is called unused pointer bits. Um, so basically, the idea is that you have a pointer, and then you have some small amount of states that can be represented in just a couple bits. Uh, so all pointers to objects in the uh, dynamically allocated objects in the kernel, at a minimum, are at least pointer aligned or better, which means you can assume basically four or even eight uh, byte alignment. And those unused bits at the bottom of the pointer value can be used for other pieces of state. For example, booleans or small integers. And because you could use small integers, you could do a type encoding scheme. So for example, the, po the pointer can point to several types of objects, and that small integer value at the bottom will tell you what kind of object sits behind the pointer. And this is kind of nice because you, you have to ha create a set of helpers to dereference the pointer. And therefore, since you have to go through a helper, you, you, you have control over how people gain access to the object, and therefore you can do some form of nice type safety that way. And actually, uh, it, the cr most critical element in using this technique is designing the helpers in a way that works uh, reliably and isn't error prone. Uh, that's an important part about using this technique. So basically, the people call the helper function. They get the pointer and maybe some piece of metadata like the type behind it, for example. 
So that's a, that, that's a one way to save some space in data structures. Um, here's an example. I showed you the metrics value, and it was an unsigned long, but it's a pointer to something, right? It's a pointer to an array of metrics uh, stored for the route. Uh, so we encode it as an unsigned long, and for the unused pointer bits at the bottom, we store uh, two, beat two flags, and one flag is read-only, and one flag is rep-counted. So we try to share memory for desk route metrics as much as possible, and how do we do that? If we assign uh, a const or a, a shared piece of memory for the, for the route metrics, we set the read-only bit. And this tells the desk layer that when we release the route, we don't have to do anything with the backing memory. We just forget about it, right? And we just null out the, the metrics value. If it has the ref counted bit, and Eric Dumaze added this code, uh, we have a dynamically allocated piece of metric state, and we need to decrement a ref count associated with it and then free the memory if necessary. So it's all about uh, object management. So this is really cool. It can allow us to mix uh, non-dynamically non allocated metrics with uh, dynamically allocated ones, and that's a really neat trick. Um, earlier I spoke about the unionization of state-specific state, so we have a, a structured member that's only used in two uh, formally disjoint points in time. This means that we can use the same memory space for the two different objects, and therefore we define a union for those two values. Here's an example. In struct sock right now, we have uh, SK send head which is used for various protocols to maintain their send queue. But for TCP, we now use a RB tree. We don't use this SK send head value, so we can, for TCP sockets, uh, we used the TCP RTX queue, RB root pointer, uh, and therefore these two objects can share state because TCP will never use SK send head, we know for a fact, and vice versa. Protocols that use SK send head will not use T TCP RTX queue. So that's one, another thing you can do. Lookup keys instead of pointers. Uh, basically, the index to some object in the kernel that's looked up in a hash table or some other data structure, you can store that inside the data structure instead of the pointer to the object itself. Now, one major thing that needs to be taken into consideration uh, if you want to use this technique is how, how inexpensive is it to do this lookup. If it's an RCU lookup into a hash table, you can probably do this, and this is typically where we, we uh, apply this technique. So one example is that the, uh, the packet metadata structure returns, uh, stores the incoming device that the packet arrived on in a member called skb underscore iif. And we used to store the actual pointer to the net device there, but instead we just store the if index, and we just look it up as needed. Uh, another thing to take into consideration is not only you can do this when the lookup is cheap, but when the lookup is done very infrequently. So even if it's slightly expensive, if we do the lookup infrequently, we may be able to apply this technique reasonably as well. So that's one thing to look into. So I'd like to thank uh, NIPA and Director Cho for helping organize this technique. Uh, let's give NIPA a round of applause. We really appreciate all their help. I like their link, Rulam and Eric in particular, because they've worked on things in this area and they realize the value of data shrinking, so I like to point them out in particular. So let's give Eric and William a round of applause. <laughs> and I like to thank not only people who have shrunk the data structures in the Linux network, network, but those who will in the future do so. I am thanking you right now. So, um, so one thing you need to understand as I was going through this presentation and working on the desk entry, that last beautiful picture of the desk entry, I still see some improvements that can be done, but I, I had to stop myself. I had to not walk over that line and keep doing it, otherwise you guys would be like, Dave's just gonna work on it, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> so please look into this, especially on the larger data structures like StruxSoc and uh, the network device. I'm sure there's an enormous amount of low-hanging fruit that can be taken care of and uh, some fun projects for people to work on to make our data structure smaller. And finally, I'd like to thank Linus Torvalds, who gave us the this fun toy to work on for these past couple of decades. Without him, we wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. So thank you, Linus, very much. Any questions? Microphone for Dave Ahern. It won't get it. I want you to be on the record, dude. <laughs>
So one thing to remember about the uh, data structure shrinking is the real memory allocation is actually rounded up to the next power of two. So getting it down below those is really even a bigger win. I think we even did that for dust, dust entry, right? We got under 128. Yeah, so what I mean, like the net device is actually a 4K allocation because it's a 1900 byte. Even though it's so just around 2K yeah. or so, right? Yeah, so that's something to take in consideration. Uh, one goal to strive for is to get it under the next power up tool. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much for spending the time to listen to my presentation.